I, I'm, uh, I'm Andrea Kurtz. I'm from the Department of Outcomes Research at the Cleveland Clinic. And I'm going to talk a little bit about perioperative thermoregulation and take you through the very basics of physiology. We'll talk about how uh, general and regional anesthesia affect uh, thermoregulation. And afterwards, we'll talk about consequences of perioperative hypothermia. Now, normally in unanesthetized people, um, temperature is very, very well controlled. So most people who are sitting here in this room and hopefully aren't anesthetized <laughs> will have a core temperature around 37 degree uh, uh, centigrade. Whenever this core temperature changes, this change triggers certain thermoregulatory responses. And those responses are with an increase in core temperature, we know we start to sweat. With a slight decrease in core temperature, we get peripheral vasoconstriction. And what I mean by that, this is arterial venous shunt vas vasoconstriction that happens mainly in, in, in the periphery. And if the core temperature drops even further, we start to shiver. Um, the range between um, uh, sweating and vasoconstriction is called the inter-threshold range. So we have the sweating threshold, the vasoconstriction threshold, and the inter-threshold range. This inter-threshold range is usually tiny. It's 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degrees in patients who are not anesthetized. But that changes dramatically once we start our anesthetic. And with uh, anesthesia, the, as, as you can see over here, the inter-threshold range can become as large as three or four degrees. Uh, all anesthetics, or most anesthetics so far tested, impair central thermoregula thermoregulatory control. And on this slide, you only see some examples of the most typically used um, um, inhalation anesthetics and opioids, dexmedidomidine, <coughs> and propofol. And what you see here is on the, on the x-axis is always the anesthetic in um, increasing doses, and on the y-axis, the core temperature or, or the core temperature thresholds. And for example, if we look at desfluram um, here on, 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 on the left, you have the non-anesthetized state, so zero mac. And with increasing doses of anesthesia, you see a slight increase in the core temperature when patients start sweating, but you see a fairly dramatic increase a decrease in the core temperature when patients um, are for, for vasoconstriction. So you see the inter-threshold range I talked about here is much, much larger with one meg of desferin as opposed to no anesthesia. And that pattern is pretty similar with, with the opioids, with propofol, with, with dexmedidomidine. And that means that increasing doses of anesthetics and narcotics decrease the vasoconstriction threshold. And as vasoconstriction is a very important defense mechanism against hypothermia, it allows patients to become <coughs> hypothermic. And of course, the larger the interthreshold range, the more hypothermic patients uh, would become. Now, hypothermia during anesthesia always develops in a very, very characteristic pattern. And if you look at this curve here, you see that at the beginning of anesthesia, core temperature drops fairly quickly, about one degree. Then we have a slow, linear, further decrease of core temperature. And then eventually, when patients become cold enough, um, a core temperature plateau establishes. Every one of these three phases uh, has a very specific ideology. For example, the first phase, redistribution hypothermia, happens because when the patients come to the OR, 
as I wake, they have a normal core temperature, let's say around 37 degrees, and usually they are peripherally vasoconstricted. That is because they are cold, they might be afraid, they might have pain. So the core temperature is much, much higher than the peripheral temperature, so 37 degrees, and peripheral is probably anywhere between 31 and 235. Now, with induction of anesthesia, we induce peripheral vasodilation, and that causes a flow of heat from the warmer core to the colder periphery. So the core drops approximately a degree, and the periphery becomes warmer, and that causes this first large drop in core temperature, which is solely due to anesthesia. Surgery hasn't even started at that point in time yet. Later on, I said, we have a further slow linear decrease in core temperature, and that is basically because patients um, lose more heat by any one of these mechanisms during surgery as they can produce metabolically. And eventually, um, the patients develop this core temperature plateau. So once patients get sufficiently hypothermic, and that depends on the um, anesthetic, dose of anesthetic, etc., hypothermia induces <coughs> peripheral arteriovenous shunt vasoconstriction. So, uh, uh, and, and this vasoconstriction results in a constraint of metabolically produced heat to the core. So at that point in time, at least core temperature doesn't drop anymore. Patients still use, uh, uh, lose heat peripherally, but you'll see that core temperature uh, remains fairly stable. Um, so, I've, I've, I've so far talked about general anesthesia and narcotics. Um, during regional anesthesia, hypothermia develops just as much as during general anesthesia. Um, um, a regional anesthesia causes a central peripheral and behavioral inhibition of thermoregulatory control. And what you see here, this was a volunteer study where we had volunteers on one day without anesthesia, and then we had them come back on another day and gave them a spinal anesthesia. And you see, on the control day, the interthreshold range here is tiny, as to be expected, and when patients had the spinal anesthesia, the interthreshold range, again, is much larger, almost as during general anesthesia. Um, regional anesthesia is tricky because um, patients uh, can't really regulate behaviorally. At, at the time when the core temperature drops, patients usually feel comfortably warm, and, and we all know that when we induce a spinal anesthesia, the first thing we ask is, are, are your legs getting warm? So patients do actually not realize that they are hypothermic at that point in time. It's also tricky when you combine regional and general anesthesia. And what you see here is um, patients undergoing surgery either with enfluorine anesthesia or enfluorine plus an epidural anesthesia. With enfluorine alone, you see redistribution hypothermia. Then patients further drop their core temperature, and eventually they, they develop this core temperature plateau. However, if they have a regional anesthesia in addition, due to sympathectomy, they can't really have effective peripheral vasoconstriction. And what happens is that they drop their core temperature. They not only have their vasoconstriction threshold later, see, as opposed to here, but they also do not develop an effective core temperature plateau and therefore do become quite hypothermic. So um, um, regional and general anesthesia do produce significant <coughs> hypothermia. Now, um, 
this was only a little bit of physiology. Uh, what, what I now want to switch to is to talk a little bit about consequences of hypothermia. Um, and uh, consequences of hypothermia can develop intraoperatively, immediately, postoperatively, or even days after surgery. The most important intraoperative consequences is a um, change in pharmacodynamics, uh, pharmacokinetics and dynamics of some of our anesthetics. For example, if we look at volatile anesthetics, um, the MAC of isoflurane and halothane decreases about 5% per degree uh, centigrade reduction in core body temperature, which is quite a bit. If you look at propofol, Three degrees of hypothermia increase plasma concentration by about 30%. And it's very similar for muscle relaxants. I'm only pointing out vecuronium here. The duration of action of vecuronium is more than doubled by two degrees of hypothermia. And, and that is important because we pay a premium for drugs nowadays that are extremely short acting. I mean, most of those are more, more expensive. And if we don't consider that hypothermia might change the duration of action of these drugs, then of course we are somewhat in trouble. One consequence of hypothermia that happens in the immediate post-operative period is shivering. Shivering is always triggered, almost always triggered by core hypothermia. Now, the incidence is actually not 40% anymore. It, it used to be fairly high. We, we don't see shivering that often um, nowadays in the ORs anymore. We do see it, but it's, it's, it's less prominent as opposed to 10, 15 years ago. Um, and I'm not going into detail. There are many, many ways uh, shivering can be treated from skin surface warming to any one of uh, these drugs here. Another uh, uh, consequence of, of uh, perioperative hypothermia is that it prolongs uh, post-operative recovery. Uh, this is a study done in, in patients undergoing colorectal surgery where we looked, where we randomized patients to either normal thermia or hypothermia intraoperatively and then used an Aldred score to determine fitness for discharge from the PACU. And what you see here is on the um, y-axis, the percentage of patients that were fit for discharge, and on the x-axis, the time. And you see that at any given point in time, almost more normal thermic patients were ready for discharge as opposed to hypothermic patients. In numbers, this translates into an approximately 30-minute uh, prolonged discharge time in hypothermic patients. When we then added a core temperature of greater than 36 degrees to the Aldred score, which doesn't have a core temperature requirement, the difference between the two groups was even much, much larger, um, and in, in numbers, about one and a half hours. Um, a consequence of hypothermia that happens in trend postoperatively is uh, increased blood loss. This is a meta-analysis that looks at all the prospective randomized trials that look at perioperative blood loss with high point normothermia. And what you see almost all these trials are uh, on the side which favors normothermia. So in almost all these trials, there was more blood loss in the perioperative period um, in patients who were hypothermic. Um, in numbers, there was about 20% more blood loss per degree centigrade of hypothermia. And what's even more important is that uh, normothermic patients had less transfusion requirement. And that is really, really important because many of us nowadays think that trans giving transfusions or blood during surgery has, is associated with poor outcomes. So avoiding transfusion is actually very, very important. And if we, of course, have to transfuse a patient only because it's hypothermic, it's, it's pretty unacceptable. <coughs> 
Um, Myocardial outcomes or adverse outcomes are consequences of hypothermia that mainly happen in the immediate post-operative period. In this study by Steve Frank, he randomized patients to normal thermia without active warming and uh, with active warming and hypothermia without active warming. I have to mention here shortly, these are all studies that were done more than 15 years ago when active warming was not standard of care and, and, and active warming was actually being introduced. So randomizing patients to non, no active warming was possible at that point in time. It's not possible nowadays anymore. Um, you see that his hypothermic patients were about one and a half degrees colder than his normal thermic patients and what he showed is that there were more morbid cardiac events in the hypothermic patients as opposed to the normal thermic patients in the first 24 hours postoperatively. And there were, was more ventricular tachycardia in the hypothermic patients. Um, it was interesting to see because we've always said these cardiac events could be related to post-operative shivering, increased oxygen consumption, and many of these bad things. There was actually no correlation between that and bad outcome in that study. However, he did see a threefold increase in uh, norepinephrine levels in the hypothermic patients. And I guess we can make the assumption that that's probably not too good for the heart. Um, the last consequence or complication of hypothermia I want to mention is hypothermia and wound infection. Uh, there are some reasons to believe that hypothermia could cause wound infection. First, it directly affects the immune system. And secondly, as I mentioned before, it causes peripheral vasoconstriction. And if, if we make the assumption that we have a large wound and, and, and vessels around the wound start vasoconstricting, then they are not perfusing the wound as well anymore. They are not transporting oxygen, which is essential for bacterial killing to the wound. And all that together could cause an increased incidence of wound infections. Here we uh, did a study in colorectal patients, again, more than 15 years ago, almost 20, I randomly assigning patients to no active warming, which is the hypothermic group, and, um, and forced air warming, which are the normal thermic patients. And what you can see is that we had almost three times as many wound infections. So the incidence of wound infection was three times higher in the hypothermic as opposed to the normal thermic patients. What was interesting in this study, though, was that also the duration of hospitalization in the hypothermic patients was more than twice as long as opposed to normal thermic patients. Now, I can't really explain that. And I also have to mention that, that these, at that point in time, these were still fairly small studies, anywhere between two and 300 patients. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure why the duration uh, of, of, of hospitalization was affected quite as much. However, that study was confirmed a little bit later uh, by another study, not done in colorectal patients, but small operations. And those people actually also randomized patients to hypothermia and normal thermia. And, and you see, it's, it's almost the same result. Almost three times as many wound infections in hypothermic patients as opposed to normal thermic patients. And that actually makes normal thermia more effective than even antibiotic treatment, which is, I think, pretty exciting. Now, to summarize all that, um, we've heard that general anesthesia causes a central thermoregulatory inhibition, um, a dose-dependent and anesthetic-dependent increase in the interthreshold range, Regional anesthesia causes a central, peripheral, and, and, and behavioral uh, uh, inhibition. 
Perioperative hypothermia is associated with major complications such, such as increased morbid myocardial outcome, it promotes bleeding, increases transfusion requirement, and it increases the risk of wound infections and prolongs hospitalization. And then, of course, there's also a bunch of, which we say, more minor complications, such as drug metabol changes in drug metabolism, prolonged recovery, shivering, and thermal discomfort. So if you consider all that, all, all these complications, and if you consider the fact that perioperative hypothermia nowadays is preventable, there's, there's actually really no reason not to do that. And I think at this point, I'm turning this over to Dan Seslam, who will be talking about monitoring and management of perioperative hypothermia. Thank you. <laughs> 